live from the Jack and Jones Shredder Studio in beautiful CCM at the University of Cincinnati. It's the Dennis Daniel Show. Tonight's guest, voice actress Wendy Lee. Plus, John Pokemon and the Dennis Daniel Show Band. And now, here is your host. He is the 2009 BearCast Innovator of the Year and the President's Choice at the Main Street Stride, Boogaloo Shrimp, Dennis Daniel! It's time to get fucked. It's time to get crunk. It's time to step it up, knuckle up, and blow the roof up. Right time for me to get fucked. Right time for me to get crunk. Right time for me to step it up, knuckle up, and blow the roof up. They can't handle the truth. They want to a loose cannons on the loose. Beware, I'm coming through. Big daddy, big boss, got big dreams, and no hesitation. I'm stepping up to the main thing. And I know what you're all saying. Conan, what happened to your voice? Because, 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 because Conan's coming back to the TBS because he got dropped. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and children of all ages, I welcome you back once again to none other than the single greatest talk show segment, The Dennis Daniel Show. I am your host, the leader of the All Taste Explosion Brigade, and BearCastRadio.com's Innovator of the Year for 2009, Dennis Daniel. Now, joining me back once again for the first time for the first live interview we've done in, ah, oh, gosh, ages, phenom, eons, Quite thousands of years ago before Paulie Shaw started in Biodome. He is the Keon to my Haruhi Susan Mia, the Spike Spiegel to my Faye Valentine, and Gluco to my Batch. If I knew what those analogies were. If I knew what those analogies were, too, we'd, we'd all be rolling and down. He is the boss, he is the mon, he's the John Pokemon. Chicka chicka yeah, what up gangsters? No fake ID? Fake ID, fake, fake ID. ID. Fake ID? Oh, I could do it, I gotta look stupid. Fake ID. John, how you doing, man? I, oh, I tell you. I ya. am absolutely <laughs> fantastic. Man, I tell you, it has been crippling since you haven't been here. I know, obnoxious. This is the first live show you've done with me in, I don't know, in like four months. I've just been living and laughing and busting my ass. You're like the other half of my Two-Face, so... Yes, absolutely. You know, I really need you now. So. Absolutely. Right. Boys, so folks, I tell you, we've got a great show today. If you just... If this is your first time, I welcome you. If this isn't your first time, well, welcome back. We've rolled out the welcome mat for you. Do you want, do you want something to drink? Can John take your coat? Yeah, we've got some fiends now. They keep coming back for more. Yeah, keep coming back for more. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, you know what they say? They all check in. They don't, they don't check, check out. out. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, folks, last time on the Dennis Daniels show, we had none other than WWE superstar John Cena. And if you missed that, shame on you. I'm not uploading it to iTunes. Yeah, shame on you. Okay, I uploaded it to iTunes. But I won't tell you where it is. It's under shrimp cast. I tried being a, a hard ass and, and uh, I, didn't I, quite work out. I'm a nice me. guy by heart, John. Yeah, yeah. Now today on the Dennis Daniel show, we have got voice actress Wendy Lee. And oh my gosh, John. OMG, LOL, to epicness. Raffle. Raffle. Lols. Raffle. Uh. Now, if you don't know Wendy Lee then you might not have been paying attention this entire time. She has been around. I tell you, she has been around longer than, than me or John Pokemon for that matter. Mm, really? A fascinating fact. And I am not making this up. You can call the police. You can, you can, you can go look at it on the great Google in the sky. As of April last year, she has had 223 voicing credits to her name. She has more credits than in, in this medium than any other English voice actor. You know, that that's amazing. Man, that is. English voiceover actor. 223 you know, credits. 223 credits. And we're wow. not talking. And, and they're all not these little itty bitty baby teeny weeny little voices. I mean, we're talking some famous people here. Now, she's best known as the voice of the sexy, sultry, and spicy Faye Valentine from the Cowboy Bebop. Now, now, John, you know Cowboy Bebop. I am familiar with this Cowboy of Bebopping. Yeah, yeah. They 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 aired every um every Saturday night at two a.m. on yeah. the Adult Swims. Uh, I don't know why I'm up at two a.m. watching, but it's worth it. It's worth it. You know, I mean, 
Great programming like that. Yeah, that show is classic. And, you know, we're really lucky to have someone who ha- who was there, you know, you know, it was made into a movie. Did you know that, John? I did not know this. It was made into a movie, Cowboy Bebop, subtitled Knocking on Heaven's Door, but we're just going to call it, uh, you the know. The Cowboy Bebop movie. The Cowboy Bebop the movie, you know. For I sure. wish they released the Blu-ray, you know. I can see all that in Blu-ray action. But I don't know. Maybe I'm just going crazy. Yeah, yeah. Now, she's also known as this character. I, I don't know how to describe her. Uh, her name is um, it's Haruhi Suzumiya from the melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya. And apparently... Try, try saying that five times fast. Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya. 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 Yeah. Didn't actually want you to do it. More just kind of a joke, but... Again, you took it too far. John, I take it too far. You know that. You are obnoxious. Now... Now, for those who don't know who Hari Suzumi is, she's this 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 kid, this student, because I guess I guess students can only be anime characters apparently, and she is interested in the supernatural. You know, aliens, time travelers, espers, shapeshifters. Oh, she should come by and check out my wife. Oh, <laughs> what wife? Is he married? The imaginary wife that you have. The the wife I reference for comedic, for comical purpose purposes. For, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but um, and she's and she forms this brigade, the spreading happiness all over the world with Haruhi Suzumiya Brigade. Yeah, that's that not f- that's not conceited. That would be fantastic. Well, it would be fantastic. Well, spreading know. happiness. Uh, yeah, I have never heard of this brigade, but if we are spreading happiness, I feel the need to join. No, you don't want to join her because she's Haruhi is. Uh, how do I put this eloquently? Offer freaking rocker. Oh, nothing wrong with that. Yeah, offer freaking rocker. You know, and she um she she first off she pulls this girl uh, a redhead girl Mikuru Asahina in and, and you know the first thing she does when she sees her and what is that ropes her. Oh man. Yep, goes for the boob squeeze. Nice. You know, just out of nowhere, you, you don't expect it. How was that possible? How was that even possible, John? I don't know. You tell me. Better yet, maybe Wendy Lee should tell us. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe she, maybe she she should. Maybe she should. No, I mean, aside from those two, she's also a Konata Izumi from Lucky Star. And, and Konata, I tell you, Konata, you no, know, she's a girl after my own heart. You know, I like anime. I like being, uh, what's that word? Lazy? Yeah. Lazy. You sure you know? are good at it. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good at being lazy. But, you know, it, it, it makes me wonder if that show was nothing more than a big marketing gimmick for Haruhi Suzumiya because there is a ton, a ton of Haruhi Suzumiya references. Yeah, uh, yeah, very well could it, be. It's like, it's like if we looked at the camera and we can went, be sure to get all your D-Generation X merchandise now on clearance at www.shop.com. You know, and, and usually when we have a guest, I like to decorate the Bearcast studio with, with memorabilia from some of their shows. Sadly, I do not have anything from any of Miss Lee's work. I, I I don't know how, you know. Well, I understand that the the money is money is super super duper tight. You know, money is tighter than a drum. Tight. But folks, I, I think I think you're out. I think there are people are going. Okay, bring out Wendy Lee there, circus boy. Yeah, they're done well, here. Let's hear talk. some voices there, show boy. Yep, yep. So let's get right down to it. Oh boy, this is going to be fun. Are you ready for fun, John? I'm ready for fun. You know, you got the entire seat, but for this interview, you're only going to need the edge. Oh wow! My next guest is a very accomplished voice actress, director, ADR writer. And writer, writer. She's best known as Faye Valentine from Cowboy Bebop, Haruhi Suzumiya from The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya, Konata Izumi from The Lucky Star, TK from Digimon, not not adult TK, like little tiny baby, little baby TK, you know, when he had Patamon and they were on that island. That was that was good programming. And she's also known as Key in the critically acclaimed Akira. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado. Let me give it up. She is the whole voice and show, Miss Wendy Lee. Miss Lee, thank you so much, and welcome to the Dennis Daniel Show. 
Thank you. Thank you. I'm trying to get the confetti out of my mouth. Yeah, okay. we got confetti. We got confetti and music. And, and the <laughs> balloons and the streamers. And the dancing tubas. It's just how we roll. Yes. I, yes. I, <laughs> I, hope we, I hope we didn't overdo it. You know, we like to try to make our guests feel like the very best celebrities in the history of this show. So... That's why we do the overzealous introductions, but of course, overzealous. So you're not you're not too unfamiliar with something like that, considering it's wonderful. You're, Thank you for such a reception. Uh, yeah, but again, we have tons of fans who just been requesting. I oh, should get Wendy Lee on the show, and lo and behold, you're the fruits of your labors. You are now here on the show in the present. The future. Why, thank you. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I guess an appropriate place to begin would be how you got your career started in voice acting. Well. I bet everybody's got a different story. You'll probably find when you talk to other voice artists, but uh, it, there is no one path really that leads to the voice work. It's sort of um, almost like a mishap. It's, it's something I set out to do, but I was a, a working actress early in my career and uh, working part-time jobs and picking up uh, any sort of employment where I could to support <laughs> myself as an actor. And I was doing some studio singing, and I had been adapting and writing lyrics for some time. And one opportunity led to a studio session where I was invited to come observe uh, some auditions for a new show that was a Japanese show. We didn't even know it was called anime at the time. And I went to uh, observe, and there was a break in the schedule, and... They had 15 minutes to kill, and the producers turned around and asked me if I would like to audition. And I flew into the booth and had no idea what I was doing. And before I knew it, I was cast in a little show called Robotech. Nice. Nice. So it was just sort of like a a compilation of many things that kind of snowballed, and here you are now. One thing yeah. led to another. Yep. It's true. It's it's interesting. I'm always curious about uh, asking my colleagues how they began in voice work as well, because we all sort of happened to be in the right place at the right time or had a friend who gave us a referral, because there are no proper channels to explore. So I like to share that with folks who are interested in aspiring to get into this crazy field, that there is no set place. There's no set way in stone. It's sort of following your heart and watching for opportunity. Very nice. Now, um, now I had read in an interview on on the internet somewhere that uh, you you originally got interested in voicing when you were uh, doing doing voices in school, and you got in trouble for it. Is that true? I was that kid in class, constantly uh, doing impersonations of the teachers and faculty, and throwing my voice into different uh, areas of the room, and. Um, uh, not claiming responsibility, but getting called out from time to time. And I did have a specific um, English teacher that told me I'd get nowhere with all that nonsense. And I haven't had a chance to uh, let her know that it turned turned into a career. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go, go there. Go. Hey, teacher, guess what? You were wrong. Suck it. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't, Something along those wouldn't lines. say suck it, maybe. Kind of just rub it in their face. Yeah. Very nice. BearCastRadio.com. This is the Dennis Daniel Show. We have voice actress Wendy Lee on the air. I know voice actress. actress. We got a female. Mm. She sure is pretty shelled. It's normally just a bunch of dudes up there. I here. know. You know, it's, it's usually a sausage fest. You know, what are they doing wrong? We want some males. I don't I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. If, um, if you have questions for us, I am us at DJ Bearcast. John, get that up going right now. You know, we gotta, we gotta pander to these people or else we're not going to get listeners. Um, um, now, another question is with um, which voice actors do you work with frequently as well? I mean, as usual, as I know, you're I know you're probably pretty busy in the anime industry. So are there any voice actors you have frequently work with? I do. I, there is a core group of talent in Los Angeles, California, and I ha- am very much in circulation with this this. Uh, we've been around for some time now, and that's why you often see the same uh, names in the cast of various productions, because there is this great core group of people that are really fast, really experienced, very efficient. So I work with, uh, I work with Johnny Young Bosch quite a bit. Uh, I work with Barbara Goodson, uh, Bo Billingsley, um, 
I'm going to look through uh, look through my Facebook contacts. Where we're talking, <laughs> I'll give me a faster hey, list. Wait, when you <laughs> said Johnny Bosch, at least 20,000 girls just screamed. <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, so many. Let's see. I'm just cruising through here. Doug Stone, um, Michael McConaughey, Dave Mallow. Oh gosh, so many! Uh, if you if you have time, I can keep scrolling. <laughs> uh, 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 let's just well, we'll just we'll we'll save that for later on in the show. <laughs> uh, just now, I'm um, now I, I I just heard about this last week, and forgive me if I'm if I'm if I'm stupid, but I I read that you worked on Power Rangers as Scorpina, and I, I'm looking. I, I Google the photo. I'm like, that looks nothing like her, and then I hear from a source that. That was dubbed. Exactly. So, yes, so- that's, that was one of my first season characters, Scorpina. And we even, uh, we were so happy with the success of that character that there was a time they were trying to locate the actress in Japan to bring her out to California to shoot some new footage and new scenes and to really develop that character further. But we were never able to make that work, and uh, I really enjoyed the time I had with that character. It was a blast. I, I like Scorpion. I mean, I, I like I like normal size Scorpion, not not make my monster grow size. Uh, exactly. You can, <laughs> you can, yeah, you can keep that. You can, uh, we'll, we'll 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 keep the relationship professional there. Uh, yeah, but later. <laughs> uh, gosh, I am just oh boy. I mean, working on Power Rangers, that must have been a great thrill. I mean, because me and my brother, we loved Power Rangers growing up. It was one of our childhood favorites. And and I just learned this, like, like yesterday, Tony Oliver, who would later go on to voice characters like Lupin the Third, he was a, he was like a, he was like a a writer or a director on there. Yes, he was a producer and he wore many hats. He did direct some of the B Unit shoots and Hmm. he was instrumental in giving me one of my first opportunities to voice direct the cast of the show. I worked, um, and it was a, it was an interesting time because it was really a machine. We would um, shoot. They had the shoot going on downstairs in the warehouse, and above the uh, soundstage was a recording studio where we did all of the ADR, um, the voice work that the actors have to do to match uh, the picture. In the case of the Rangers, whenever they were wearing their helmets, all of their dialogue had to be dubbed in studio. So I was often directing the cast in that capacity. And it was almost a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week production facility because they were shooting um, the live action, and then we were working in post-production, voicing and cranking out multiple episodes a week. So it was really quite a a well-oiled machine at that point. Mm -hmm. And many of the folks that we worked with on Power Rangers are still uh, the pros that I work with today. Now, I've always wanted to know, because I've seen it, and I, I mean, I've noticed there's some dif- differences, but um, how is voicing, you know, doing a, a, a dub over for Power Rangers different for, like, doing an anime? Well, it's live action, so whenever you actually have human beings on screen, um, massaging that dialogue into the, the flaps, the motions of the mouth is more technical. It's a a little more fluid work, and any live-action work takes just a little more attention to detail. However, I'm a bit of a perfectionist and known for that, so I apply that same skill to dubbing anime as well. The goal is that the character should sound like the language that you are hearing is originating um, in their Um, dialogue, and it isn't something that's foreign and being forced into uh, the lip flaps. So there's just a little, it's a little slower, and it tends to be a little bigger budget, and we are generally um, creating the template that will then be exported to other countries, and they'll use our dialogue and our footage of the characters, and then they'll translate into their language and then they're working to achieve the same goal we're achieving in English. So it's a, an interesting combination, but we do a lot of films that are live action, and once in a while we'll get a, a Spanish soap opera or something that requires uh, dubbing it into English, and we always our goal is to try to make it really uh, convincing that it is actually a production that's done in English. It's sort of like uh, life's like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. 
sort of like that, yeah. <laughs> Life's like a box. <laughs> you ever see the Mad TV skit, um, Forrest uh, Gump Fiction? You know what they call a, a burger in France? What? Okay. What's that? Uh, it, no, no, it was it was a parody. It, it had Phil Lamar, and he was doing a uh, Forrest Gump gotcha. Pulp Fiction, which ironically he was, you know, it was in Pulp Fiction. That's funny. Now, uh, here's um, another question. Of course, um, now I know you've done, I know you've been um, you've done a lot of, of of famous women. You know, Dokuro Mitsuaki from Bludgeoning Angel to Kura-chan, which I I wouldn't sit near on a bus now with that giant <laughs> me- spiky bat. Th- oh man, that's got our gotta tear the baseball up when you hit a home run you know um and you've also done faye valentine you did takato shimizu from show bits um do you feel like you're getting typecasted as these tall sexy and beautiful female characters more often than usual or or, or do you get a chance to pick who you do and you see something you like about them and you do them Unfortunately, there is no picking of of characters. As an actor, you just want to work, so you are always in the position to say, yes, thank you. (laughs) Yes, I'll play that part. Thank you. We have very little uh, deciding um, sway, so to speak, when it comes to what characters we get to play. There is a bit of typing probably going on, but I think I'm really fortunate in, in that my two types tend to be those sultry, powerful, awesome women that you speak of, and also the zany, crazy Dokuro chan types. So I, you know, I've done Tina Foster and um, and Maya and um, gosh, so many different characters that are really outside of a, any specific type. I know that I have a lot of experience with fighting efforts in all the game titles that I do, and certainly going right back to the Power Rangers days. So I think I also get my fair shot at really strong women that are tough-ass fighters. Ooh, are we allowed to say that? Oh, oh yeah, go ahead, say, say it. Not normally, no, but for you, Miss Lee, we will make an exception. It's because a good thing about internet radio. The FCC isn't really regulating us. The FCC will let us be. So let you and we'll me. We'll give a so shout-out to them, too. Uh, no, not the FCC, because we're going to be trying to hop over to the FCC regulation after this season on BearCast, and uh, we're, we don't want to be censored. We have... <laughs> You ever hear the First Amendment? No, we're not into folk music. <laughs> well, I'm lucky that I really do get to play strong women often, but I've got a sh- my share of vulnerable, um, dramatic girls, too. And as an actor, the the more you get to vary it up and the juicier the role is and the more uh, screen time your character has, the more fun it is. And that also means the more work you get. So I don't feel frustrated as a voice artist in being typecast because I think I do get my share of variety. And after all, I'm happy to have the reputation of being the go-to girl for those powerful, sexy girls. Why not? Hey, hey, I tell you, Flay Valentine floats my boat. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> uh, weird. <laughs> Uh, I apologize. Florida, I apologize for that, for talking about Faye Valentine floating the boat and, and be with the starving pig moves down to New Guinea. Amen. Oh, man. oh yeah. she'd be flattered. Oh, she would be <laughs> flattered. <laughs> <In more way. laughs> oh, man. I'm making innuendos and I'm not even trying. Ow. Now, aside from doing, like you said, you do all these, you do the sexy women, you do the, the, the timid little girls, like, ooh, no, 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 no. She always seems like she's crying or something. Those big eyes are like, what, 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 like when she's smiling, like, what's wrong? I'm always crying. Quit crying. So, but I, again, off on a tangerine. But you've also done, and as hard as this is to believe, you've also done some, some, some boys. And, and, and I think, I don't know if you've done more than one or two, but I think your most notable ones are TK from the first season of Digimon and my personal favorite, Yahiko Miyojin from Rurouni Kenshin. What's it like? How's, how do you transit from doing all these not all these hot, uh, beautiful women to, to these kids? Oh, it's awesome. I love that stuff. It's just the more I can expand my range and the more characters I can develop, the better. Really, the key, especially for me, is variety. Uh, that's what I love about being able to direct a little, do some casting, a little singing, some adapting, some writing, and a whole lot of voicing. That's that's what really is most gratifying for me. But I just thought that TK was the cutest of all the Digimon ever, and he just loved his brother Matt because he's the bestest. 
You're about to be killed by Devimon, and all you can say is, this is scarier than the movies. I would say, <laughs> I'd say, run! Ah, forget them! Forget Matt! Get out of there! Well, well again, it's, I, 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 liked, I liked TK. I, I, I liked, really like Yahiko, you know? He, he's trying to be this tough kid, and deep down he's got this soft side, and you know, he's a brat. <laughs> kind of like, kind of like brother here. Uh, I think Yahiko actually had something for Kenshin. Oh, really? He, he not only admired him, but he admired him a lot. Yeah, I I, uh, I agree with you, Yahiko. <laughs> I, am, I admire Kenshin a lot too. That I do. <laughs> oh, unwanted Kenshin joke. Oh, is this guy is this guy must be hilarious. Well, I have to say, Yahiko almost took a little piece of my voice permanently because uh, he was so physical and um, emotional and. Very loud and very athletic, so that was a real workout. I had been uh, working on that show for at least two years, and I would always have to schedule it at the end of the day and generally at the end of the week because it would blow out an octave of my voice in most sessions, and, uh, and then I'd need to go home and recuperate. Uh, and now, well, while well, we just drive into another question, do you have you? Have you, has it been really hard to do like a, a certain voice because it's just such a strain on your vocal cords? I mean, like like Yahiko has, has it you know has has it come to a point where you have to stop you know try to catch your breath and then do it again? But it, it just it, it, it's taken so much energy to do it that you just can't. That's pretty much the case with Yahiko. Sometimes that happens with video games because there's so much fighting and combat and. Uh, death scenes and uh, every, every imaginable sort of um, um, damage to the, that the character takes, and um, it does blast your vocal cords. Um, uh, many of our friends call it uh, throat ripper sessions. When you go in and just rip your vocal cords up for you know your uh, couple hours that you're in there. So there are real casualties to <laughs> voice the voiceover industry. And the men get it especially hard, but those of us, uh, the women that do play male roles, we take it pretty hard in the vocal cords, too. So that's, that's my longest running character where I just had the voice, like, grinding, just sitting right there in the mid to low range, just grinding on the cords. And after a while, you know, it, it does just, it literally knocks an octave out of my voice. That just sounds painful. Often when I go in for video game sessions, I ask the director and the producers what characters I'll be playing. I, I often get cast for multiple roles because I do have a little bit of a range going on. So I always request that we do the young and soft voices or the little girls first because that's going to be an octave or two higher in my range and as we get into the throat rippers we do those at the end of the session and then i'll blow it out on the death scenes and then i got nothing so it's important to know what you're playing before you go into a session or at the beginning of a session because often that's all you can do in a day you're you'll need to really uh, take care of your voice after that a lot of throat code and honey and echinacea and and you're good to go in, in, in a couple days. I just, I, 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 I just, just watching it makes my throat sore. You know, all these, <laughs> all the screaming, all the, all the, all the stuff scenes. I mean, we um talked with Kyle Abert, he, he from 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 Dragon Ball Z um a while back, and there were times that the screaming when he was doing the uh, energy attacks or the Kamehameha waves that he would pass out. Oh wow! Yeah, I've directed Kyle in a few sessions where he had to. He was using so much texture and, and all of his chest voice and to the point that he just um, completely collapsed coughing. We often have that happen, but you take breaks, you pace it, and that's also why many voice-over sessions are only two hours uh, at a time because we know if you're, you can only scream for so long and then you've got to rest the cords or you're going to be good for nothing for several days. And Lord knows we can't afford to be unemployed that long so yeah. uh, um you know on a side note voice work doesn't always pay the best so it's a a very big challenge to stay afloat as a working voice artist it just it must be terrible to do voices in when the seasons are shifting and you're doing a role where you gotta scream your lungs out and you got allergies oh absolutely absolutely and some people are doing plays in the evening and some of us do musicals and are singing, so you have to be especially protective of your vocal cords and really pace yourself. And 
only you know as an artist when you're you're reaching the brink, and it's important that you communicate to your producers and to the directors in the session. Most companies understand that and work with us on it, but bottom line is if you're only in for one recording session on a title and you're going to be screaming and dying, you're going to have to give it up. So we, many of us are sacrificed, and we leave it, in the, leave it all in the studio for you folks to enjoy in games. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> We will, we will yeah. applaud we you apply. for that. We bow before your greatness. <laughs> we bow before us, the sacrifice and the eternal sacrifice. <laughs> BearcastRadio.com. This is the Dennis Daniel Show. We have got Wendy Lee, voice actress extraordinaire. And after hearing that story, you, you got to be extraordinaire because I, I could not do I could not do that personally. I, I'm getting a sore throat right now just being me. Now, we're broadcasting from CCM. It's called Conservatory Music at UC, and we have a lot of vocal majors. Um, do you have any advice for those out there who want to aspire to be voice actors or actresses? And uh, how should they go about making their way into the industry? Well, our industry is taking quite a hit right now. This is uh, one of the biggest lulls and dips in business that we've seen in decades. So this is a very difficult time to break into any kind of voiceover. That said, there are people working every day. So there is... There always is room for new talent, but it's rough. It's a rough road. The most important thing is to have a second form of income, to have a alternative dream that you're cultivating while pursuing acting, because there really aren't many people that come to Los Angeles or, or New York or Texas or any of the places where recording is really concentrated and are able to work solely as voice artists. We all tend to have other things that we do. In some cases, people still wait tables and have temp jobs and a number of other forms of income. Voice acting is, being an actor is an expensive uh, profession. You have to have money to produce a good uh, uh, demo CD. You need to be able to afford to take workshops and classes. And it is the path of a performer. You need to be in theater and building a resume and studying and continuing to make an income so you can support all of that. You have to have pictures and cards. and It's, it's a lot of work being an actor. It's difficult. But I encourage uh, anybody who's interested to continue to build your credits on your resume. Perform. That's the thing. It's acting. Get out there and act. Uh, Take speech courses, learn dialects, um, get into as many shows as you can, be, pursue the on-camera, uh, but to really uh, plan for, uh, brace yourself for the hardships and a life of rejection and struggle. That's, I'm the one that always comes in with the, the reality, <laughs> the hard-hitting truth about how difficult it is to be an actor. I've coached uh, other actors and directed and and um, help to teach and um, prep people for a profession as actors. And I'm always very, what, very sober about how hard it really is. Sometimes you got to be, you can't really sugarcoat some things like that. Exactly. And it takes a tremendous amount of fortitude because you audition all the time and you constantly face rejection. And only certain personality types can handle that much dire- rejection. It's, it can be overwhelming. The blues can really take hold. And um, even those of us who have been working all these years are all finding that work is quite thin right now. Japanese titles are not being licensed like they were. Anime is on a major downturn right now. There just isn't that much anime going on in general. Most of the studios I work for aren't even doing anime anymore. I can only think of two studios uh, that are working constantly, Bang Zoom and Studioopolis. But other than that, most everybody else is uh, kind of, you know, vi- uh, competing for the games that are available. So seeking employment in this field right now may not provide much employment. That's the truth. But if your dream is to be an actor, you know, go for it. But be prepared to have a second form of income to support it. Oh, uh, well, talk about your real folk blues. <laughs> oh, that's not, oh, they're struggling. Um, now, well, since we're talking about second job, do you have a second job outside of voicing? 
I don't now, but I did for years. I had a dance troupe. I taught theater. I uh, was a artistic director of a private school for four years. I have had a number of crazy jobs. I really did everything I could other I, other than wait tables. I tried to always keep my hand in something creative to continue to work toward my goal of being a working professional actor. So um, I was always doing uh, a number of part-time jobs or uh, production work. I worked um, in production for Fox for some time. Boo, hiss. But I um, <laughs> Boo, hiss. <laughs> but I was also a working in soap operas and commercials and, uh, and doing theater. So I was always very much immersed in my profession. But that's actually what led me to becoming a voice director uh, because it was another source of income. Well, let's, let's transition right into there. Um, how did you get your start in directing, and do you prefer it to a uh, voice acting? I ultimately per- see myself as an actress. That's what I set out to do, and that's really my first title. But most of my work over the years, over the last several years, has been directing because it's more hours of work. Voice acting can be just anywhere from a couple hours to four hours uh, here and there uh, and on during the run of any given title. But when you're directing the show, then you're working all the hours that the show works. So um, I love directing. It's something that I plan to do uh, for the rest of my career. But... Um, I like a combination of the two because I really like to mix it up. I like being able to do a few auditions one day, a couple voice sessions, come home and write a little bit, uh, go to production meetings, be in a studio and direct for a long period of time, and then break it up and repeat the cycle again. So I thrive on the variety, but I know a lot of people are very happy with any one of those roles. I just happen to, you know, want to do as much as I possibly can in anywhere, any arena where they'll have me. <laughs> now, I um, I read that you're, you've also written for, uh, you've also done some writing. You've done, you did uh, Wild Arms, Twilight, Venom, which I've, to be honest, I've never seen. But my question is, do you find it uh, more challenging to write dialogue for an anime instead of, you know, doing the voice itself? Or does it come a little, little easier, like secondhand? Dialogue comes very natural to me. That's, as a writer in any arena, that's the part of writing that is very organic for me. So dialogue flows very natural for me, and I do a lot of story editing and uh, tweaking of the dialogue when I'm directing, even if I wasn't the writer. I do a tremendous amount of rewriting on Bleach, and I'm not writing any one episode per se. But to tailor dialogue to match the vibe of a character and that scene and that genre is really kind of my specialty. So many of my producers rely on me to sort of smooth out the dialogue when we hit the studio. So that's very comfortable. In my own writing as a, as a lyricist or a screenplay writer or playwright, playwright the dialogue aspect is what I, is, is really my strength. So that's comfortable. I wrote a lot for theater and for stage, and that comes naturally. Um, but writing in itself is, you know, is a whole other profession, and it's something that I was studying and training for anyway. So it's interesting as an actor how you'll find anything that you have training in, anything that you have experience in, generally will come into play as an actor in some shape or form at some point in your career. So another little tip for aspiring actors is to do a lot of different things and to train in many things. My dance background helps me a lot. It could um, come into play for motion capture, and that's something I'd like to get into. So having a movement background is really helpful. All of my uh, martial arts training, which is minimal, has been very helpful for me when it comes to fighting efforts and everything else. Of course, my singing training has been uh, invaluable. It's been used repeatedly over and over. And then being in bands back in the day and and writing lyrics and all of that helps me adapt musically. Um, I rewrote all of the lyrics for the Haruhi songs, and they... um, Bondi was kind enough to go with all of the revisions that I made, and and those are the songs that we recorded. Uh, We got a question from... um... 
Goki from the HaruhiSuzumiya.net website. Since you're talking about writing for the songs for Haruhi, um, how did you feel about singing God Knows for one of the episodes? And he says your singing is magnificent. Well, thank you very much. I sure have seen some uh, positive and nasty comments circulating on the Internet about those songs. So, you know, it makes you not want to uh, stick your neck out and, and have it chopped off when people are so critical online. Oops. But, yes, I was thrilled. That was something that uh, Bang Zoom and Bondi teamed up for, and we were all really excited that Bondi was willing to uh, put a budget together for us to be able to do that. As you know, most anime songs are not re-recorded, and it's generally a, a budgetary issue. So Bondi has been so betty betty good to me over the years, and they uh, really believed in me and had confidence in me to re-record and rewrite, which is something the Japanese hold on to very tightly. Their uh, lyrical, uh, poetic content, as you know, does not really translate literally into English. So they allowed me to take liberties with the songs and to rewrite them in the spirit of the song, but not a literal translation. And I just had a blast. We spent, um, we really took time um, one, giving me the time to really hone the lyrics, and two, the time that we took in the studio to re-record. And it was a blast. It was so much fun. You know, I got to actually really record the song to the picture and do our best to make the sync massage in place. And um, unfortunately, some of the YouTube clips of the songs are completely out of sync. And that is just so disheartening because... That's not the way it is in the actual um, sanctioned series. The series has everything uh, synced up per perfectly, but for some reason those YouTube clips are just way out of sync. It drives, it drives an actor crazy. Hmm. But that was a lot of fun. We, we would love to be able to have a shot at re-recording more music in the future. Yeah, they were out of sync. So you YouTube haters, you stop that. We're coming to your house. We're breaking some kneecaps. She knows Susan Mia. We'll, get some, we'll do some super kicks. Jump in the air. Huh. It's so funny how they step up to the talent show just to fill in at the last minute, and everybody is an amazing musician and, and uh, performer. <laughs> well, well, it kind of helps when you got the powers of God. Huh. That's true. She, that's cheating. <laughs> cheating. Yeah, see, that's kind of disheartening, you know? And, and, and what about the guys after, who performed after? You can only imagine, like... Oh, well, what the hell? How are we going to top that? <laughs> yeah, no, no it's, kidding. Hard act oh, to gosh. Oh, my God. It's my accordion. Going to play a song. <laughs> How do I top singing as a bunny girl? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I'm glad. Um, BitterCastRadio.com. This is the Dennis Daniels Show. We have Wendy Lee on the air. Now, I bet you get this asked a lot. Um, if there is a character that any sh on any show that you like, who would you mm. want to be and why? Who would I actually want to be? Yeah. Oh, well, probably a hybrid of some of these characters. Um, let's see. Of course, I'd probably start off with the Feifei Fei model Smoke and then Fei give Fei. her um, the all of the magical abilities of Haruhi, but give her sort of the sarcasm and the slacker kind of leanings of Konata and then throw a little Tina Foster in there for being uh, the American happy party girl and maybe make her, uh, give her the, the kick-ass strength of Maya from Tenjo Tenge and um, I'd have an all-around pretty happening girl. I'd throw in a little Kiva too from um, Megas XLR nice. and be the, uh, the voice from the future. Yeah, because you know what they say? You! Dig giant robots. Oh, Pokemon digs giant robots. We dig giant robots. Chicks <laughs> dig giant robots. Nice. I was about to say that. You know, you have some brain in there, too. Definitely. I wouldn't oh, mind a little Yodoichi ability to uh, switch into, uh, shapeshift into a black cat, too. That'd be cool. Why would you want to be a cat that sounds like a dude? Because he's so incognito, no one would know he's a chick. Oh, well, he's very, very, very <laughs> sneaky. Well, oh, well, he, well, she, well, she, she fooled me. Mission accomplished. <laughs> hey, dude. I was just in the studio yesterday recording some more Yodoichi. 
Yeah, she she is she is she is a, a sight for sore eyes. You know, easy on the eyes there. Yeah. I have to agree. We talked about um, having a mentors with um, Kyle Abert. He. He, 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 of course, one of his mentors is Steve Bloom, and Steve Bloom's mentor is the guy who did Porky Pig. Do you have any mentors? I don't necessarily have anyone that I worked with. There are so many artists that I admire. You know, really, it goes right back to Mel Blanc for me and June Foray. I just loved everything that they did in the classic old, you know, Warner Brothers and Fractured Fairy Tales and uh, the... Judy Jetson, and, you know, just different specific characters. A lot of the Disney um, feature films had a big influence on me. I love classic American animation, and I adore uh, certainly international work and all of the anime and Japanese influence. I feel I've, I've lived in Japanese immersion for years culturally, so I feel like Japan is almost a, a, a sister nation to me. But... There isn't any one person I ever studied with or worked with, and I know Steve Bloom very much believes in mentoring people because he was mentored by people he admire. He admires, but um, I actually am mentoring different people myself. I'm working with other new talent, nobody that I can really speak of or that you'd recognize. But I know that we feel we'd like to pass the torch on to other generations for really high, keeping really high quality consistent. And uh, Steve certainly believes in that, and I know he has been more than generous with with Kyle personally. So um, that's always really beautiful. But not any one person per se; more more just influences. Yeah, well, it sounds like you would have a lot to share with the next generation. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a big part of of the learning process is all that you take in and then passing it on for others to keep alive in their work and for them to do the same. Absolutely. I'm not even really a big fan of, um, of anime. Ignore that. He, we don't know what's wrong with him. Yeah, yeah. Oh, what, oh I what, see. And you're telling me this why? Well, I'm just telling <laughs> this because uh, I feel, you know, just sitting here listening to all your experiences and all your advice, I feel like I can go conquer the world now. Oh, beautiful. Why would you want to conquer the world? Don't, don't cross into Woody Lee's territory, man. You know, she, this is her. Conquer the we world. We won't tell how to heat. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're, you're in a cross into Hari Susan Mia's boundaries. Uh, okay. We do that. Oh. That's, that's us thing, man. Uh, t- now, you've also, I know we talked about you voicing uh, video games. How is voicing a video game a lot different from voicing an anime? It's a whole different paradigm, really. When we're working on anime, we're working directly to the picture. So it's a very intimate one-on-one process. It's just one actor in the recording booth, and you've got your headphones, and you've got your script stand, and you see your image on a television monitor, and then you've got an engineer and director in the, uh, the sound studio. And so you are working one little piece of dialogue at a time to get the best performance you can, to make it fit to the picture, and then you move on to the next line. Well, with gaming, generally we don't have a picture to work with. We're, je- we're usually creating the work, originating the work here in the States. Sometimes we have Japanese titles, and we will... I'll explain that process. You'll often hear the Japanese line, and you'll be reading the translated line in English. And after you hear the Japanese line, then you replicate that performance in English, kind of matching the same tone of the voice and the energy. And there's this interesting process that happens when you're exposed to the Japanese language or any language over a period of time. I feel like I can intuitively extract the emotional quality of what I'm hearing. So that's my job to interpret in an English performance. So sometimes it's almost like blind work. You're not seeing any images. You're just working with audio. Or you're not working with any audio at all. You're just working with a script and uh, your production team, and you're creating that dialogue. Sometimes we have time constraints, and we have to be within a certain uh, one, 1.9 seconds of dialogue to say one line or whatever the given time is, the length of the line, because when, they, uh, when the programmers enter the audio files into the finished product, if the line's too long, it could actually crash the system. So we have to be very careful in some cases that it's a very um, technical aspect of the work that we're doing. And that tends to be what voiceover work is, right brain, left brain work. 
um, kind of very technical yet very artistic. So it's a completely different process. Video games tend to move much, much faster. In a, a recording situation for anime, we our target is to get about 25 lines of dialogue recorded per hour. Now, many of us vets who've been around forever can do upwards of 30, 40 lines an hour. Johnny Bosch, when I work with him on Bleach, is can knock out 50 cues of dialogue in an hour. No problem. He is really, really quick. And each of us that you see our names again and then again in the credits, it's for a reason because we are the workhorses that can produce a lot of high-quality work quickly. So it's really painful is my opportunity to... Uh, to reach out to the listeners and just say it's very painful when we hear people criticizing us for the sheer fact that we're working a lot. And that's something that I see on the Internet quite a bit. So when you guys are in your uh, basements typing away hate on the Internet, just want you to know the actors are hearing that in many cases. And we're really in a rough position because we just are trying to support ourselves. We're, we just want to work like everybody else. And we certainly can't engage any of the haters and get into a, an altercation with anyone. But it is very painful and very disheartening to hear people put us down for the sheer fact that we work a lot. And in my case, I'm a big target since I have a lot of credits. And um, since I hold a, a record over any of my peers, I am the one that kind of gets my head cut off the most. So yeah, well, <laughs> I just well, well, want to know, well, I'm just trying to make a living, you know, and even though I've had a lot of titles, it doesn't mean that I'm sitting pretty and I, you know, don't ever have to worry about bills again. <laughs> exactly. Well, let's, let's remind you, Wendy, that if, if you're getting crap from these guys, you know, we can, uh, you give us some addresses. Uh, we'll rough we'll, them up. We'll go I rough gotta, them up. I got to send them your way. You're right. We'll, we'll beat him up. We'll be more fierce than that gang of traveling Tom Brokaws. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like someone's a little lost. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. while we're on the uh, the subject of the internet and you know how how people online have affected you, um, I just got a Facebook message from one of my good buddies uh, that I went to high school with named Ryan. Ryan Patterson, and he wanted me to ask if you know. That there is an adult film star using the name Faye Valentine. What is there really? So, yeah, what? I, no, I, I, oh I can't confirm this, but he did just bring it to my attention. I'm sure we could probably Google this let's and find Google, out. Let's Google this, son um, bitch. But yeah, he he said yeah, there there is a porn star using Faye Valentine as her <laughs> screen name, and I believe. Let's see. He says he's pretty sure that. She said the show is why she picked the name. Well, let's 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 look. Let's see. Yeah. Well, son I, of a gun, it is. It is. I'm I'm honored in a way. I'm flattered yeah. that she recognizes, you know, the the sex pot that Faye is. But I don't think Bondi would be very happy about that, and she might want to look into the legal ramifications. <laughs> I'm sure there. Yeah, she probably kinda... spelt it differently, or you know, something along nope, those lines. Nope. Yeah. It's F A Y E V A L E N T I N E. Oh yeah, well, she, well, she may be finding herself getting some uh, legal mail from um, Bondi you, uh, International. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> watch, we watch, didn't watch just call her up. Her watch call her up one night. Do Faye tell you're gonna break her kneecaps? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, she's a working girl. I can't blame her. Yeah, she's, <laughs> yeah, she's getting it how she lives, I yeah, guess. Yeah, you, you call that working, I don't know. No, in yeah. a way, that's actually uh, quite flattering because <laughs> she's looking for some sort of high-profile, you know, um, gorgeous, powerful, sexy girl. And um, instead of creating something on her own, she's, you know, on the coattails yeah. of Fei Fei. Oh, well, yeah, there there you yeah. go. Pop, Just, pop, uh, smoke, smoke, Fei Fei. Not everybody's out there trying well, to hate on you. Since we're talking you. About, since we're talking about Fei Valentine, um, I know you go to a lot of conventions, or maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> um, and I, I, I know you've noticed, you've probably seen a lot of, of Fei Valentine cosplayers, Um I just well because these uh, two are probably infamously known, um, and I know one of them personally. Uh, have you by chance seen the uh, Faye Valentine cosplay done by Hezachan Heather Duggar? Um, I don't know anybody by name. I know I get I get photos of girls that are cosplaying as Faye Faye. I always enjoy it. I share them on my Facebook. I actually really like having um, a collection of. Any of my any of my characters that people are cosplaying, I love to have the photos. I think it's great. 
And anybody brave enough to get into yellow latex and bear it for cosplay, hey, more power to you. Well, 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 Wendy, there, there. I, I have to draw the line with one exception. There's one person that did that, and I don't know. Have you heard of the legend of Man Fay? Man Fay, yes, I think I even have him on my Facebook. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I've had a couple sightings of him, and boy. He's brave. <laughs> but just seeing all that, oh my, oh my gosh. You, you know, letting all that just hang there. Ugh, it's like, and, and you turn around, it's like a walrus flossing. It's like, oh, I'm like, oh man, I just, well, it looks like so I'm going to. You'd rather, you'd rather, you know, rip your own eyes yeah, yeah. out. Have you seen this, John? Look at this. I have not. Look at this. Look at that. Oh God, Ugh. yeah. I kind of wish I would not have seen yeah, that. Yeah. He is not short on hair. No, no. Uh, oh, wow. I thought they'd all be purple. <laughs> uh, I, thought the, I thought the carpet would match the drapes. Jeez. Ugh. Yeah, well, it looks the, like I'm going to. The very first convention I went to right up until now, it's always been a whole lot of skimpy cosplay outfits. You know, that seems to be a big draw. Well, mm. well of course. I, and I, I bet you that there is an ocean of Haruhi cosplayers. Oh, yes. I've seen a lot of Haruhis. I was just in London for the London Film and Comic Con, and there were several there. But I have to say, the the most striking costume cosplayer that I saw in London was a Jessica Rabbit. Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, she was uh, gravity, gravity-defying. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess she was the breast. Best, be, best, 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 be, 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 best. I said best. John, John quit, quit saying breast, John. <laughs> Okay. Jeez. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Lord, I apologize for saying breasts and be with the pigs down New Guinea. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're having fun today. Okay. BearcastRadio.com. This is the Dennis Daniel Show, and we have got Wendy Lee on the air. I well, I guess. Well, let me see. Do we have any more questions? I. Well, no. So I guess uh, for us. So I guess we're gonna go ahead and open the polls, folks. Open the polls. If you got some listener questions. Hit us up on Twitter at AT Explosion or IMS at DJ Bearcast. We have got we got them open up, so we we're gonna hit head first right into these. Are you ready, Wendy? All right. Okay. Question one. And this comes from our good friend Martin Waters. Martin Waters. Hope you're listening there, Martin. I got the Trixie autograph. I appreciate that. You're super awesome for doing that. He asked, what was it like to voice Yuri in the uh, redub of Dirty Pair? And he also wants me to say that. You were better than as Yuri than the actress who played her in the 2003 redub by ADV. Oh, I didn't know they redubbed it. <laughs> oh. That's new to me. <laughs> no, it's funny. I'm looking at my classic vintage Yuri doll that I got, one of my very first uh, toys in my collection. And um, it was great because I was working with a good friend who played opposite <laughs> me, but I can't name her name. I don't know if she used it in the in the credits. But that was fantastic. That goes back to working with Carl Masek, whom we missed terribly and just lost recently. But he um, he picked me for that role. I don't think that was even an audition. Well, 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 well who would? I mean, well, I mean, I, under, I understand. You know, young, young, wild and young. You know, you got. I mean, but you got. I mean, I thought it was a very well done performance. You know, and thank you very. I much. just I think that Martin really enjoyed it too, or else he wouldn't have asked me to say it. Well, do we know who played Yuri in the in the 2003 version? No, but we can figure that out right now. I'm curious. I don't. They must not have done that in Los Angeles. It we have the technology. A, a we can see. find it. We want dirty pear. I wonder why those dirty pears were never cleaned. You know, could have got some Clorox in there. I don't know. Uh, there he goes making more bad jokes. He needs to stop making so many bad jokes. Let's see. Jessica Calvello. Oh, I have heard the name. And then Hello. she was replaced by Allison Summerall. And... Well, see, it just goes to show you, it takes several women to replace my one performance. Ah, because uh, you're just that <laughs> damn good. Oh, the, this leads into our next, well, it's not a question, but it's a statement. It's from my good friend Cedric Smith, and he wanted me to say, I just want to say that I think you're an awesome voice actress and that you are, in fact, the whole voice and show which means he thinks that you're the whole effing show, you know? Oh. And that he loved you as Batch from Mon Nights. 
Wow, nobody talks about Moncoli Nights. Thank you so much. How can they not talk about Moncoli Nights when you got Gluco? You know, uh, rocking body. Brilliant. I-, I love it. That that was a really fun run too, and that was airing on a number of local TV channels. So it was. Really fun having some content that people could get a hold of for free. Yeah, it um, aired over here on a, on a Fox 19, uh, Fox Kids. I, I, I would really try to watch it every Saturday morning. I mean, you know, Digimon was there. Might as well watch it, too. Uh, I just I was just watching um, I was watching uh, Send in the Frogs yesterday and, <laughs> uh, and just seeing every just seeing um, Rockna freak out every time she see a frog. And I just and it, it was really funny, you know, and I also liked I also like. When you did Miss Loon and uh, and love, oh, I absolutely adored that role. She was such a freak. It was so much fun. <laughs> yeah, but you know, she was never lucky in love. Oh well, no, she wasn't. And it was really, it was interesting because I went on to play some other characters that were similar to her, but they had little different voices in general. But. <laughs> that was just so much fun. I enjoyed that a lot. Yeah, just, just, he he just really likes Gluco and Batch. Yeah, uh, it was, uh, just it's just weird because you know why was Batch wearing a tube top? It made no sense. That's true. I'd be like, put a shirt on, you hippie. <laughs> hey, you had nothing to show there, you know, you, you, you kids. He was always self conscious about it. Yeah, I know. Did you? Did you? Um, I don't know if this was before or after Kenshin. Did I? I can see kind of a similarity in her voice and Yahiko's voice. A little bit, because she was a bit of a tomboy, you know? Uh, So there was that kind of a similar energy. But uh, it's always easier to kind of stay in a tom girl kind of range rather than getting right down into a boy range. You know, it's just a little step of of, uh, separation there. And once again, I'll say it to Batch. Put a shirt on, hippie! Yeah, I got, I got no shirt there, you beatnik. <laughs> okay, and I apologize for that. So, um, yeah, okay. Our next question comes from Mew Wolf Five. What are your least favorite and favorite roles that you have played? I guess the only thing that's disappointing is when you you get into a character and then it gets killed off quickly. That's always really disappointing because it means you're fired. <laughs> There's no more work. Um, I don't really. I've never really played any characters that I just didn't like i can always find something in the character that's engaging or challenging so when you approach it from an actor's perspective you just want to work you just want your your chance to be able to create as many different voices as possible so and i do get that question a lot but it's not we're not in the position to pick and choose like i was saying earlier we we just want an opportunity to be working and creating all the time so I can't think of anybody. I know I've had a couple that bugged me that were just obnoxious. Um, nobody comes to mind because those aren't the, the lasting memories. But my favorite experiences are the bigger known characters. And, of course, Feifei is at the very tip top of that bunch. But I've had other characters. I loved Charlotte and Vampire Hunter D. She was, you know, so forlorn. And the goth look of the show and the the love affair and just the, everything about that character I just loved. I loved working on that. Um, I loved being in um, we the proper pronun- pronunciation, Akira, Akira, yep. playing K, you know, being involved in a classic like that was just the best. I love that. I like the voices I did in Austin Powers and the Austin Powers movies. Wait, 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 wait. You were in Austin. I did see that uh, under Austin Powers, International Man of Mystery. You were the Fembots. And how, how did that work? That was a blast. I was part of the loop group that was hired to come in and pick up all the incidental voices and background voices. And in the course of working on the film, they had some specific characters they needed voiced. And they just would go through the group of girls that were there and have each of us read the lines. And I got selected to do some of the the big uh, narrative scenes with Mike Myers, which were hysterical. When he uh, first comes out of his uh, deep freeze and uh, wakes up and finds him, himself no longer in, in the 60s, he, um, he goes through a warm liquid goo phase. Warm liquid goo phase. Now that was you. <laughs> so that was me narrating all that whole scene with him. It was so much fun. 
Oh, wow. And did you get to meet Mike Myers? No, he actually did not come on set for any of that stuff. He did um, his his own looping, his own uh, ADR work uh, privately when the group wasn't there. But it was just so much fun to be a part of any of his franchises. It was really a blast. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I didn't, I, I, I did not know that, you know? Uh, that was, I mean, all I can say is, yeah, baby, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, got, uh, uh, enough of that now um another question from you wolf five is would you consider your role as yui hongo one of your easier or harder roles yui um i can't remember what yui's in is that uh let, hang on let me is let, it mystery play i can't remember uh fushigi yugi yeah we also called it um mysterious play uh, um that was great. She was almost epic because it went on for so long. We, I didn't work on it regularly like every week, but I worked on it probably over a period of three years going in off and on to work on it. It was really interesting to me because you have to understand uh, from the actor's perspective, you're only seeing the scenes that your character speaks in. So your character, like her, may have a lot of screen time, but they may not always be interacting vocally. So it was always a mystery to me, and I was constantly trying to keep up with the story, and, and I remember the director wouldn't tell me what the outcome was. Uh, they kept saying, Let's just, you, I, don't read ahead, just wait till you see it. They wanted me to be very fresh and in the moment as she goes through all of her changes. Mm-hmm. So that was one of those characters that you get to live with a long time. So they kind of work their way into your psyche. It was a really great experience. Yeah, for all we know, Yui at the end saves 15% or more on our car insurance by switching to Geico. <laughs> 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 uh, that was just for me. Tom rules the universe. Uh, I, I, I think Susan Mia would have something to say about that there. <laughs> um. What do you think of the second season of the melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya's plot device of repeating the same events over and over again for eight episodes? Did you think that this was an interesting and unique or just plain annoying? Uh, yes. <laughs> it was yeah. both. Oh. First of all, I just, ah, for the record, you're getting Endless Eight. Uh, we, that, I spent my whole summer working on the Endless Eight. Uh, months of just <laughs> experiencing the same scenario in different settings and different costumes. But over a period of time, it kind of, I kind of got into it because I look for all the nuances of my character. I like to check out their costume, their setting, their home, their shoes, what they eat, what their interests are, all that stuff. And those are the things that kind of varied and changed up with the same storyline being played out again and again. After a while, I I got on to the convention and understood what was going on. But initially, it was slow moving. It was rough. And it was driving me crazy because I was the first person who was voiced in most of those scenes. So I didn't have any of my fellow characters uh, recorded to play off of. So I was originating the scene for the rest of the cast to follow. Um, and it was very lonely at times, but... <laughs> Uh, we had high hopes of being able to do all kinds of uh, silly, spoofy things, but Bond, I wanted to keep the fans happy because you guys are a very vocal bunch that can be extremely critical. So we didn't get to do the sort of uh, playful experimentation we were thinking of. We kicked around a lot of ideas, um, changing up who voiced which character within the cast was one of the ideas we had, um, changing the dialogue every time. Uh, to make it uh, uh, very, you know, varied and changed. Many of the uh, voice actors were texting each other while we were in the booth recording, and we record one person at a time. And I know Johnny Bosch and I were going back and forth with each other going, are you kidding? They're going to go swimming again? Fireworks again? All of the things that we had to go through. The festival again? And <laughs> I would say, hang in there, buddy. You're going to get through it. So we'd pep, each, pep talk each other through the uh, Endless Eight. But I was really sorry that so much of the episode of, revolved around the Endless Eight, of the, of the season, rather, because I was really hoping to sort of lay the groundwork for a possible third season with its popularity. But that's, of course, up to Japan, ultimately. Yeah, Japan, you better be listening, because <laughs> I think these guys want a third season. <laughs> well, they don't even know they had a second. 
I got it. Oh, it's okay. So, so, so you are in the second season. So, for all those who were wondering, for those, for those who didn't know, now you know. And knowing's half the battle. Because knowledge is power. G.I. Joe. Um, here's another question. Is, are you working on the dub for the disappearance of Harvey Susan Mee movie right now? And if you are, can you tell us about what you think and how it's coming along? We have not begun it yet. Uh, we, it was interesting. I just had a conversation with the producer, producers last week. I wasn't sure what was going on with that. But stay tuned. It is still to come. Well, maybe, maybe we'll have to have you come back on and tell us about it later on when it's... Yeah, when it's, good idea. We'll do a follow-up. Yeah, so oh. so you, so you another reason why the Dennis Daniels Show is the only place you're going to hear this stuff. So so you better be bookmarking that website at alltasteexplosion.com. Hey, shameless plug. We got that exclusive stuff. We got that exclusive-ish. Yeah. Shot a. Okay. Um, his last question is, what are your favorite slash least favorite aspects of Haruhi Suzumiya's character? Oh, gosh. She is – oh, she's work. She's a piece of work, isn't she? Um, I love that she is so confident and effusive, and her bossy nature just cracks me up as much as it can be off-putting. Um, I love that she's just got big ideas and lots of energy, and um, I certainly can share some of that with her. Um, I, you know, she's beautiful. She's talented. She's bright. She's conniving. She's I, her interests are intersect with mine. I I can relate on many levels with her, but she can be a bit of a despot and and a brat and bossy and <laughs> conceited. But I suppose that would, that's what happens when uh, the world depends on your every mood. <laughs> Bossy, conceited, and a brat, it's, it's like I have a twin. <laughs> but she's cute and likable at the same time. She knows how to use her charm. Yeah, you know? but she keeps groping me, Karu. I don't I don't <laughs> cut I don't take well to that. If and if she were here, I'd tell her to her face. Why is it that so many of my characters grope other girls? It's very interesting. I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's just you. Maybe maybe you got the worst <laughs> luck. I would like to greet them a little more politely, but you know, my characters I have to apologize for. Have you um have you gotten gifts like her he sues me a costumes or the or their wristband or anything like that from all your fans? Do I have any of that? Yeah. Well, I have the box set that came with the armband, and that's very cool. And I've done several personal appearances with actual live live Haruhis that are dancing around in costume, and that's cool. But no, I wouldn't be opposed to having one of those little uniforms. Those are pretty cute. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I'd have a I'd have a issue with having one of those uniforms because I'm a because I'm a dude. That's okay. You Got, can have a Kion uniform. Uh, <laughs> who, who am I, Crispin Freeman? <laughs> oh gosh, I, I'm like I'm the only one with some sanity on this show, so maybe that would be the. Well, I think John would be the Kion. I'd be the male Haruhi. He'd be the Kion. There you go. So he's the only one with some sanity. Man My, Haruhi. I think we started something. Uh, I, I, well, we'll see. We'll have to see. Uh, I got <laughs> other commitments. Other there was a Man Haruhi at uh, Anime Expo um, last summer, and I did get a couple pictures with him. Yep. Man, <laughs> I, I, I haven't got the bill to do Haruhi, so so if I, if I shatter some of your hopes and dreams, I'm sorry. I can't pull off the, the Haruhi look. I'm just too big. Now, Kion, well, I'm too big for Kion and and, and, and Tatsuki, so, yeah, I pretty much shattered all your dreams, so I'm sorry. Our next question from Shiraishi kun Was it hard to do the voice for Konata Izumi and Lucky Star? And we have a, a, a side question from that. Could we ask Konata what side of a Chaco Cornet is the, uh, the head, the fat end or the skinny end? Well, Konata has a big opinion about all of this stuff. There's actually a right and a wrong way to do it. But first things first, I need to get back to my video games. But, but, but Konata, we got, we, we got to know what this stuff is. And more importantly, what is a Chaco Cornet? The only Cornet that I seem to know is James E. Cornet. I just wonder if any of you are sick and tired as I am of people who claim to be the icon of wrestling. Hulk Hogan and Roddy Piper claim to be the icon. Shawn Michaels is the icon that can still go. Bret Hart would claim to be the icon if he wasn't too busy crying about being screwed by the WWE. And I guess Randy Savage is still thinking, thinking. 
Oh, he he did a wrestling joke. He shouldn't have done a wrestling joke on an anime interview. And then, Seriously, then, if you can't figure out the right end of a chuckle cornet, then you are just completely out of it. What? Why, why don't you come here and say that to my face, Izumi? I'll, I'll show you. I'll meet you online for a duel. Oh, oh, oh really? Oh, well, pff, well, let's see that. Come on, after, after the show. Yeah. You and me. Why you and you, me. Why don't you meet us at the bike racks after school? Yeah. Yeah. How did this? How did this turn? Are, is, are we ganging up against the guest? No, 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 no. We just we really like getting into we, character. We don't play by the rules. Yeah, I, yeah. We'll be out, out out by the bike rack. She, she's so such a slacker. She, I don't think she'd put out the energy to get in a fight. She'd just yeah. totally trick him. Bring Miyuki along, looking pretty good. <laughs> All right, that's. Uh, I apologize, Lord. I apologize for threatening Konata with violence. <laughs> If you could have one anime role, no matter what it is, no matter where it's taped, broadcast, whatever, what would it be? Well, I don't, I, I mean, I get to play, you know, all these amazing characters. I've got more, more opportunity to play characters probably than anybody up until now as far as having a lot of credits. So I don't really have that one part that I didn't get to do. There's, you know, I would have loved to have been in Spirited Away. That would have been a great uh, classic to be a part of, but they went with primarily a celebrity cast, so that's rough. Um, I'd like to do more American animation because I, uh, I've really had some great years with anime, although I hope to be able to work as an anime actor through, through the end of my career. We certainly have you know characters all ages, shapes, and sizes. So, yeah, there is that. I don't have that burning, burning role that got away. That fortunately, I don't have any big regrets like that. But I'm open to ideas. Yeah, let's let's pray that that your end doesn't come at a, at, a, at a very early end with with you're trying to do another Yahiko like voice and then just completely shatter the vocal cords. <laughs> right. That would that would just that'd be terrible. That 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 have to be like the like the equivalent of a, of a biker crashing along a jagged rocky cliff, so... Well, the worst fate for an actor is to get laryngitis. Oh. And we've all had it from time to time, but I finally have a, a good, healthy protocol that uh, has kept it at bay for many years. Oh, well, why don't, you, why don't you tell us about it? Well, it's really a lot of alternative and natural therapies. Um, I mentioned before echinacea and golden seal and... I use a, a, a particular liquid called colloidal silver, and that's a really powerful antibacterial for the throat. And then all of the voice actors love throat coat, which has a special ingredient called slippery elm bark, and that keeps the vocal cords malleable and healthy. And we, have, we all have things that we share with each other to try to keep our voices healthy because when the voice is out, no paycheck. When the voice is out, you want to shout. Yeah, when the voice is out, it's because you shout. <laughs> Someone should make that on a T-shirt. Um, so what other, what other guests have you had that I might know of? Well, back last year, we had Pat Fraley, who did Crying from the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I see. We had Eric Stewart, who did Brock and James from the first seasons of Pokemon and Kaiba from Yu-Gi-Oh! Cool. Then we had Little Karibo from Yu-Gi-Oh! The Abridged Series. And then we um we had Frank Ferrante. He's an actor and playwright. He um he's done the uh, tribute show An Evening with Groucho, which I thought was hilarious. He um we had Vic Mignana, Vic Mignana, because we just gotten so many requests for Vic. So and, and, and a lot of these are on the Shrimp Cast on iTunes. So all you gotta do is head over to iTunes and search Shrimp Cast, and you can cool. pull them up. Well, it sounds like it was time to get a, a female voice actor on the show. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. As we said before, yeah, it, it, was, it was a real sausage fest. <laughs> uh, yeah, and this just got explicit for some reason. Um, uh, our next question, um, what was it like collaborating with Johnny Bosch and, and Hari Suzumiya and Bludgeoning Angel Dakura-chan after you two split away from Power Rangers? Well, I have to say I have my favorites, and Johnny's right at the top of the list. He's my my favorite male actor to work with other than Steve Bloom. We have a blast. Johnny has a really high uh, goal for quality, and he's got amazing uh, comic skills. And I don't think people always know him for his comedy because he plays the straight-up hero so well. 
but he's somebody I really collaborate with. When I'm when I'm working with Johnny, and especially directing him, I often consult him uh, as to whether or not he's happy with a performance of any given take. And um, when we were working on uh, Dokudoshan, we were just completely laughing our asses off. It was hysterical. I mean, we would really have to take breaks and like you just leave the room because we couldn't stop cracking up at what we were seeing on on camera. It's just what a show that is. An irreverent, hysterical show with tons of anime references. And gore. Don't forget gore. And, oh, let's not. <laughs> gore. Tarantino fountains of blood, yes. Yeah, I, 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 I believe that would constitute a Tarantino wet dream. So, oh, <laughs> doll, we did it again. Explicit. Johnny's Ex- one of my um, probably longest running um, co stars. Uh, he's, again, I worked with him on Power Rangers. When he was just brand new in Hollywood, it was one of his first acting jobs, and we worked in ADR, and I knew him for years, and then years later, we ended up working in anime full-time, so it's been a really nice, long collaboration. I mean, I'm just, I'm just, I, I remember when he was up, when he was, oh, what was, was it, was it Zach? No, it wasn't Zach, it was, oh, what was the Power Ranger name? I I think he was like the Green Ranger, I believe, and I just... And then I see him, uh, like, like, I don't know, five, six years later in Trigun, and I'm like, you know what? That's the guy from Power Rangers? He's come quite a long way, and now he's and now he's doing, you know, Wolf's Reign, and he's doing Haruhi Suzume, and he's doing all and these... Bleach. And Bleach. And, uh, and I, I think there are, like, 20 people that went, you gotta mention Bleach, jackass! Because <laughs> Bleach is... I, I, I don't know why it's called Bleach. There's no mention of any detergent product. I can help you out with that one. That was one of the questions I had for Viz. Bleach is based on Ichigo's orange hair because when Asians bleach their hair, it turns orange, and he was born that way. So they you, they knew him as a bleached hair style, and bleach became a nickname. And I, 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 I guess the title... Orange hair guy fights demons in other world wasn't pretty catchy. A little clunky. <laughs> a little clunky. It doesn't roll off the tongue like bleach. So if you didn't know, now you know. I've never noticed how many unique names that they have no relation to anything. Like this one show, Pumpkin Scissors. I have not seen a pair of scissors or pumpkins. It's and 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 the irony in some like the melancholy of Harvey Susan Mia. I first off, I don't know what melancholy is. I had to Google it, so it's like like sadness or something. And but Haruhi is anything but sad. That's funny. I know. I guess that's the thing they're most afraid of her becoming. Yeah, and then you got Lucky Star. There are no stars that are lucky, and then there's no mention of Madonna. So it's interesting. Some of these words must sound very exotic and cool to the Japanese. Hey, you never know. A lot of these things get lost in translation. So that's possible. So um. Now you were talking that the um, anime industry is is kind of in a slump right now. Um, do you feel like maybe a major contributor contributor? And we and we talk about this with a lot of our voice acting friends. Um, the uh, pirating of anime, you know, yeah. uh, you know, you, r- ripping it straight from DVD to YouTube, it may be deferring a lot of people away from actually going out and, and buying it. Absolutely. The, I I have to. Uh call on your audience to please find it in your heart to consider supporting anime um, with official dubs. Illegal downloads is killing our business. But we haven't had this technological, um, what, interference until the last several years. And it is to the point where when I go to production meetings and we talk about Uh, the potential for any given title in a U.S. market, they say they have to weigh it against the possibility of an illegal download, and that often will kill the deal, and then we won't get a budget or um, a title to come through and be dubbed. And I know that anime can be expensive, but the more you support it, the more we can bring to the States, and it is critically affecting the abundance and the... um, scarcity of anime being produced and it's a real problem for most studios would you like to like to give a message we got music you know we got the, the like we got the um important music so if you want to give them a small message i'll we'll queue up the music and you can just say what you want to say so it's <laughs> so like like 
only you can prevent an anime from being kicked to the curb by illegal downloading. Think with your heart, not your cheapness. Do what's right for your industry that you support. Support starving actors. Buy anime. Don't illegally download. This has been brought to you by Actors and Others to Save Anime. I'm Dennis Daniel, and I support this message. That, that, that's it. YouTube video. That's going on YouTube. Folks, If now, we have an anime club here at uh, UC, Anime UC, and, and uh, we have like, and we have them in, in video format. We do not use that to substitute having it. We show that to them. We get, we get samples from the companies, and we show them because, you know, we want you to buy them. Don't download them. If you do that, Hari Suzumiya gets pissed. And you know what happens when Hari Suzumiya gets pissed? Kaboom! Paid for the committee to get anime reinstated. <laughs> the end. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, maybe we should run some campaigns, too. Um, from Respect Copyrights My Anus asks, what conventions are you planning on attending next year? And any chance are you coming back to Calgary or Edmond, Alberta, Canada? I don't know if I'll be going to Canada. We have been working on it for a couple years. I almost made it to Calgary, and I had a cancellation because of my production schedule. So I'm not sure about Canada, but I would love to come back. I've only been to Toronto, and I would love a chance to go to Calgary. I am going to a couple, gosh, you know, I'm not sure what I can announce yet, but I am really kind of stepping up my appearances next year. I had been on a uh, respite for a couple, three years. I have been laying low and not doing too many conventions, but now I'm back. I'm working with a booking agent who helps me um, get all of the uh, particulars in order, and it makes it easier for me to travel. And what I'm doing is posting these announcements on my Facebook, and I would like to invite you all to join me on my Facebook account. It's uh, Wendy Lee Dash Artist, and that's with all E's, five E's, W-E-N-D-E-E-L-E-E Dash Artist. And whenever I have a contract in place and I can speak about um, a particular location, then I announce it on my site. And also, the different conventions do the same thing. Once we have contracts signed and in place, then they also make formal announcements. But I have some really big ones coming up, a couple international appearances. The question and is, are, are you coming all to... Over the state. Are you I coming hope to, to return the... to Orlando, possibly, we're working on that one, um, uh, possibly Ohio, possibly, Woo! yeah, so I'm, I'm working on it. Coming to Cincinnati? <laughs> yeah, come, come here, come here, come here, see some of the pigs, some of the pigs running a marathon. If you can, we do another interview just here from the studio, but yeah, but it's, it's, it's nice to see that you're actually getting out, because I, I think, I think these fans, I think these fans all over the world, they love you, Wendy. You know, I, I love you, John. John, somebody. Ah, I love you. Well, love you back, guys. Uh, um, you, you guys are our audience, and you're what keeps the machine going. What was it like playing Amy in Zillion? Amy in which? I was like Zillion. God, I don't remember. <laughs> oh no, she I'm doesn't so remember. Sorry. That must have I, been thousands of I years. I mean, this ago. must have been a while ago. Uh, that one's not. Zillion's r- ringing a bell, but I don't remember I mean, Amy. I am so sorry, but you know, if you send me a comment on my Facebook, I will look up my character and I'll give you a proper answer. And 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 and, and hopefully she'll remember because you know, hey, hey, if you do these things like ten, fifteen years ago, you know, it's kind of hard to remember. I, I hardly remember what I had for breakfast. I have done over two hundred different characters, so bear with me, y'all. <laughs> it's, I mean, a, it's a wonderful burden. That's that's pretty much why we why everyone wants to call you the whole voice and show. <laughs> the original voicer, if there was no other. I do appreciate that question, and honestly, I'll give it a fair answer. If you just uh, you can contact me um, either through my website, wendylee.com, which is still under construction. I'm doing some major, major revamping on that. You could also reach my email link through the website, which is ewendy uh, at earthlink.net, and I get those uh, emails directly, and I work with a team to answer everybody's email. Or you can reach me through Facebook. 
And, uh, and of course, we'll post a link to Wendy Lee's website on our site, alltasteexplosion.com. So if, you, if you're just too lazy to remember how to enter that in, you just drag over to our website. I don't know. It'd be kind of easier to go to Wendy Lee than hit in alltasteexplosion.com. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Okay. Um, and our final question, do you have any final words you'd like to impart to your fans? Well, I'd just like to thank everybody for all of the support that I've had for so many years and for every negative comment that I come across on the Internet, I probably find 10, 15 positive comments. And I have to tell you, once in a while when you come across something that matters to somebody uh, when they support you and speak favorably of you, it can really make your day, your week, your month and we, as I say, are on a very thin cycle right now, and I rely on your support, and it means the world to me, truly. And everything about the work I do is about honoring the quality of Japanese inter- entertainment and the amazing art form of anime, which has grown in, on my heart so much over the years. And I just thank you all for... Being such eclectic, cool people that understand this amazing art form told by Eastern storytelling and what a cool uh, cultural um, intersection it's been for our, our countries taking all of this interesting and alternative perspective from, the, from Japan and integrating it into pop culture in the U.S. and being a part of that is a real honor. And I just thank everybody for giving me the opportunity to have a dream career. Miss Lee, I thank you so much. That I thank you so much for being on the Dennis Daniels yes, Show. Thank you. It was incredible. We're clapping. We're clapping. Woo-hoo! We bow before you. And it, it just, it was truly, it was truly a real thing. And we hope to have you back on the show really, really, really soon. Thank you for the invite. And everybody, take care of Space Cowboys.